and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Team Arklands. Who we've who have previously come on to talk to talk about well Arklands as well as the Book of Graces and the Arklander magazine, and now come and now back once again for another round with the Book of the Phantasm, the one and only Nick Shepley. How are you doing today? Hey there. I'm great. I'm great. Thanks so much for having us back. Really, really, real pleasure to be back talking uh, all things RPG, in particular the Arkverse with you. Mm. And uh, yes. Hi there. Yeah, th thank you for com thank you for coming on. Oh, and I hope I hope you I hope you've been doing good. I hope you've been doing good and and um, <laughs> you're and probably in slightly warmer weather than me. Yeah, a little bit, a little oh. bit. If only because every everybody on the everybody on the other side of the pond looks at looks at my winters like and um wonders if I'm crazy. <laughs> It hasn't gotten that yeah. bad yet, but give give it a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just kind of per perma perma wet here. This is like um, I, I'm in Wales, and it has essentially one season, which is warm, wet, and colder wet. So mm -hmm. there you go, grey all year round. Yeah, which well from. For me, I don't. For me, I don't mind that because I'm not. I don't get along with excessive amounts of sunlight. No. No, I'm not no. a vampire. No, you just, you just, you just should probably be living here. Mm -hmm. well, I've considered it, but knowing my luck, if I did, I'd end up getting a bunch of guests in the states, so I'd have to deal with time zone hell in a, in a uh -huh. different coat of paint. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, book of the so book of the phantasm. This is this is the this is first off. Was this was the idea for this something that that you've all that you had always planned on that you had planned on for a while, even when you were starting um, Arklands, or was the idea something that has a more recent origin story? It it kind of wrote itself. So. When we wrote the Spellforge's Companion, the, the kind of the central event in the the uh, the world lore is this event, the Sundering, where essentially the keeper, the god of the universe, dies, um, generally due to his own his own kind of uh, self inflicted problems, and all the magical energy that he's been storing floods back out into the mortal world. Now. As I was writing it, as I was writing the spell for the spell for his companion, um, I'd never really got to grips with the extent to which that must have been for ordinary mortals a terrifying, traumatizing, horrific kind of experience, uh, where you think it's it's you know, they think obviously it's the end of the world. And I and I suddenly started to write about this sensation of, you know, terrifying dreams and kind of a nightmare on Elm Street sort of experience where the dream is real and people are sharing it and they meet each other in this this dream and um there's a, a powerful presence there uh and so the the idea of this this kind of dreamlike place called the phantasm mm -hmm. began to exist and then certain people realized that the phantasm isn't a dream it's actually real and when in this waking dream they've been walking into it and that it kind of exists alongside the the mortal realm much in the way that you know, if, if you most kind of Neil Gaiman esque kind of urban fantasy sort of ideas is you know you you turn, you walk down a mysterious alley in, in you know off Oxford Street in London and it just so happens you've wandered into this universe that's existed there all the time, but the the, the phantasm kind of intrudes on the mortal realm mm -hmm. because the, the the barriers between the mortal world and the phantasm. Uh, uh, and the other dimensions have been perhaps sort of pushed to breaking point by the events of the Sundering. Mm -hmm. So gra gradually, when I was looking at it, we had five dimensions, 
of which the Book of the Graces is all about the celestial realms. So that's that's one of them covered. And we thought to ourselves, actually, do you know what? The Phantasm deserves its own book. Um, and so then we began to actually explore how it had come about and what was in it and who'd created it. Mm. Um, and the fact that a trickster kind of spirit that had always hidden inside, it had hidden itself inside the Keeper's shadow uh, since the beginning of the universe. Uh, finally, and, and it's kind of almost like a prisoner of the Keeper, though the Keeper doesn't even know it's there. Finally, at the Keeper's most weakest moment, steals five gems from uh, inside this, this vast place called the Hall of Stars, which is part of the Keeper's mind, and then that causes, obviously, the Keeper to explode. Um, and the energy and the gems and this character Onikaius together, uh, he wakes up and is in this strange place that is forming around him and goes, oh, right. And he's essentially become a god of this, this new realm. Mm-hmm. Um, and the weird, this is one of the weird things about fantasy writing, is that when you line up the ingredients of the concept, it, you know, it doesn't happen all the time because sometimes you you're tired or not in the right space. But if you are having a good day, your fingers just do the work on the keyboard and boom, you, um, you start to write and you go, ah, right. So the, the, here's what your mind tells you. Here's what couldn't happen. So that's, that's one idea we can rule out. But here's what inevitably would happen if these things occurred. Mm-hmm. Um, and then concepts start piling together and sort of making connections of their own. And that's, that is you know, for want of a better word, kind of the, the magic of it all. Um, and once you get an idea of who the Keeper is, or who Onikaius is, or who X person is, and, you know, they're this sort of either vain or malicious or secretive or trickstery or attempt a, or a character attempting to be noble and failing, you go, ah, well, then they would definitely create these sorts of problems for themselves. Mm-hmm. They would definitely try to do the right thing there and yet somehow manage to do the wrong thing at the same time. Uh, they would definitely create this sort of monster. And before you know it, you have this, this rich world. And I think there's been, there have been writing experiences in the past where I've tried to create something and you go, for some reason or another, it's a dud. You know, it's flat as a pancake. It's sort of boring. It doesn't excite me. Um... And and the the pieces just don't come together, and you know you've got to shrug and say, "Well, c'est la vie at that at that moment." But every so often you get something, and it it has just as you know your you know your if you leave your back garden, it, the plants will grow there. The, these things these things kind of have a life of their own, and that's where I think you've got a concept worth bringing to other people. Mm-hmm. Now. With the, with that in with that in mind, the when it comes to the, in a thematic sense, what would what would be the sim, what would be the similarities and differences between the phantasm compared to the celestial realms? Well, I think the the thing is the similarities is that these are both broken places. The celestial realm is uh, once a realm of perfection. And, and and sort of when it was a realm of perfection, it was sort of a charade. You have this one god who's a kind of a fraud. Um, he he doesn't create the universe. He discovers this chaotic mass that he shapes into order in the celestial realm and kind of throws all the bits he doesn't want into this this hell called damnation, which is pretty mean of him because there are some kind of primordial spirits hanging around that are not really doing anybody any harm. Mm-hmm. Um, when the uh, he creates seven the seven Athavanir who were probably sort of uh, these these kind of super super angelic beings that use their powers to or- keep the his order order of the universe in check, and then all of a sudden he suddenly realizes he cannot control all of creation because then a whole wave of thousands and thousands of uh, of graces come along the the Trallan veneer mm-hmm. who were you know little graces but still compared to a human being immensely powerful and he has to lie to them he he hasn't created them and he's very shocked 
that something can exist that doesn't come from him. I'm very upset by that. And he starts to go slightly insane as a result. But he lies to them and says, yes, I am your father, you know, and I, I, and from that lie, everything else that follows from that leads eventually to the destruction of the celestial realm. And the, the phantasm is, for that moment of the sundering, the phantasm is the accidental reality that's born. It's the kind of like the illegitimate child in, in a way. Mm-hmm. But the the ultimate father of both of these is is kind of the 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 keeper. If you imagine the the keeper is this like terrible parent, and mm-hmm. everything that they touch, the, there is harm in it. Everything that they touch is this is very Freudian. I'm going to some very dark places. Um, but everything they they touch is is kind of damaged, and the 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 dimensions that are the are the product of the keeper are. These, these kind of fallen places. Mm-hmm. There, are, there are some differences as well, though. What we wanted to do with the phantasm is in the Spellforge's Companion and the Book of the Graces, these are kind of majority human sorts of environments because humans have essentially settled and colonised large parts of the celestial realm. Uh, but And there are some non-human origins, the Nomi and the Sereans and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. But we, we flip that completely. Humans are quite rare in the Phantasm. Some have drifted over. But the majority of player uh, origins in the Phantasm are organic to that, that reality. The, mm-hmm. So they are uh, the, the creature, the, 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 servant, the faithful servants of Onikaius called the Lenari, who are essentially a lot. Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot more noble than he is. Onikaius is this trickster character, and kind of causes a lot of trouble. Uh, and um, his chief of staff, the his character called the Chamberlain of Thent, who's one of the Lord of the Lenari, mm-hmm. is there is is there essentially to stop him from doing things that are harmful to himself and to others. Yep. And then we have the Ebruin, who are kind of rather elf-like creatures, mm. but have the ability to uh, will a kind of a, a sort of a slightly Black Panther-esque uh, web of um, black diamonds a- across their bodies mm. as armour when, when they need to. Yeah. And then there are, there are the humans that have been lured through uh, by Onikaius, and he's kind of tinkered with them a, a bit to extract their magical powers but that has caused he sort of broken the magical powers within them and this is where we get the the idea of witches emerging from uh so it's 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 you know your, your standard medieval conception of the witch is mm-hmm. in league with the devil whereas uh, a, a witch in the arc verse is somebody that has been kind of broken within mm-hmm. um so anyway, anyway. There are a whole bunch of, of, of we, we've done this time, I think we've done like seven character origins in the Book of the Phantasm, mm-hmm. um, just because we, we kept, <laughs> kept coming up with more and more awesome creatures and uh, things to write about. But only one of those is, is, is human. Yeah. But it's, from, from, from some of the artwork and some of the descriptions, I kept getting this vibe of a more surrealist. Um, yeah. I, um, fantasy identity within the, within this place would that be would that be accurate? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Because we wanted to go that way. The, um, the I mean, our clans originally had a not necessarily a low fantasy vibe, but I would say mid mid to low fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have you know magic is is harder to come by. Your spell forging and all all that kind of stuff, you know, you make your own magic, mm-hmm. um, and it was always meant to be uh, the, the 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 immortal kind of Arklands motto is more Gandalf, less Potter, you know. <laughs> so, so magic is more subtle, mm-hmm. uh, and there aren't there aren't mega mega beasts like dragons around all over the place. So th- there are you're more likely to find those in the, the celestial realm, mm-hmm. and so. The, the 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 setting was probably somewhere above Game of Thrones, somewhere slightly below 
Tolkien and definitely below in terms of, of, of fantasy, definitely you, below standard fifth edition D and D. Would you say that it's more that it's more akin to the works of Vance? Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely would. I definitely would. Oh. And I think and so the phantasm is meant to be that place where you can do some pretty high fantasy adventuring. Mm-hmm. But with a with that like you say a surrealist kind of turn um and you know if you look at sort of where surrealism comes from you know you go back and look at the kind of the the art and philosophy of the surrealist movement in the early 20th century mm-hmm. it is all about that primal expression of the unconscious mind and um and, and of dreams and of trying to you know uh bring 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 the unconscious into the conscious and the phantasm is like a bad dream yeah uh, it's a bad dream where people live uh, which, yeah, actually, some people might relate to. <laughs> people go, oh, yeah, no, that's actually what my life is like. Uh, and because I will, I will note that when I, when I do run fantasy campaigns, I have a playlist that I that I use that is probably way too long for a for a gaming playlist because it, yeah because I did. Because I built it around the icons in Thirteenth Age, one hour for area music and one hour for combat. But I would, I had, I had some more unorthodox musical choices for the arc for the Archmage because magic is meant to be weird, and I think a lot of those yeah. choices could work with, with um, fat with phantasm because because of how you described it. Chief yeah. among the, chief among those musical pieces is a lot of the work that um, Philip Glass did for the Katsi yeah. trilogy. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. No, I totally. Yes, that that would definitely work. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm a huge um, huge fan of that. Um, because and sorry, you got you're because. In both in both cases, you're in a place where the where you're where the physical lo- where the physical laws or the or the laws of the world as you understand it are more suggestions <laughs> than agents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the thing is, well, that is, and I never intended this, but it sort of has worked out this way, is because the keeper has died, um, or. If he had, if, if if he is actually dead, and this is a the big question, he's sort of he might just be like pulling a sour on, and he's gone away for a few millennia, but he'll he'll be back. Um, and because this character in the phantasm, Onikaius, is the, the kind of uh, um, this sort of tri- trickster character who is sort of now uh, faded into almost kind of irrelevance. Mm-hmm. I wanted to give this powerful sense throughout the arc that kind of nobody's in charge. Um, a lot of in the mortal realm, there's no, there is no Aragorn. There's no one king to step up and rule things. Everything's a mess, um, and every the world is kind of waiting because there's a big, horrible nightmare, horrible scenario coming along that we'll be introducing pretty soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the guise of a kind of a, a sort of a, a global nemesis, and the world is 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 really waiting, and the people in other dimensions are waiting for what for a leader to step forward. Mm-hmm. And I guess if you if you're writing fantasy in the the early twenty first century, you can't help but be kind of informed by the reality that we live in. You know, we have this series of existential crises coming along and uh, everybody is you know checking their watches and wait waiting for leadership to arrive and you know it's 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 it's, it's gonna be gonna be touch and go mm-hmm. and you, you occasionally you look back at, at your own writing and go, oh right yeah so i'm just i'm just describing the reality that i exist in unsurprisingly um so so yeah the 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 arc verse it kind of everything is sort of up in the air. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, give, given given that given the nature of phantasm, and I'm I know I'm I know I asked this about the celestial realm, um, some when I had you when I had you on to talk about that. Yeah. But do you do you suppose that the phantasm lend can lend itself to, uh, to more to a more unstructured type of campaign like hex crawling? I think so. I think so. Um, I mean, what we're going to do is put in the book a kind of uh, a, a very very fluid, structured campaign for people to play. You know, which will give them a sort of like a, a whistle stop tour of not all, but maybe maybe half of of the phantasm. Mm -hmm. But the the the, the bit where hex crawling becomes interesting in this is. Um, Onikaius um, does something to, to to prevent his fortress from being invaded by all the people that hate him, um, of which there are many within within the phantasm. He creates essentially chaos. He fragments reality so that um, unless you're good at navigating, you have sort of special navigating abilities. It's possible to start off in one place and wind up somewhere completely different. So um, that might create some very interesting hex crawling adventures, where you know you're essentially being uh, not so much teleported out of or, or around uh, the phantasm, but you can turn around, you know, turn around one corner in a forest trail and wind up somewhere completely unexpected. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, yeah, it's messy. Yeah, it's it cer it certainly can be. And when it comes now when it comes to the player facing end end of the spectrum with with the, the book of the phantasm. Um there's there's a couple there's a couple of things that are introduced that I wanted to I want to cover. First is mirror magic. Yes. Now, right. Bef so we carry bef on. Before before we get into that, there I do want to make one, th one, one thing clear. Even if, even if we're dealing with new forms of casting, mm -hmm. um, are we? We're still using the spell forging system that was established in. in absolutely, Dayton. yeah, yeah, absolutely. The the way in which casters, and this is going to be sort of um, how things work out now. Um, so, to, for those that are that don't know. Um, Every character starts off as a, a kind of essentially a martial character at level one. Level three, you get to diversify. So at level three, you can pick a caster add-on if you want. You don't have to. Uh, and then you can say, go three levels as a caster if you want, and then hop out at level seven and then do a couple of levels of uh, martial again and hop in, you know, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So one of the new caster add-ons is the Mirror Mage. And the Mirror Mage, basically, um, it can do a degree of spell forging, but they also get some some pretty exciting uh, abilities as well. And I think the the way that we it, the way that we do things is sometimes you're going to get a caster add on that is far more a spell forger. That's just just what they do. They make spells. Sometimes you get a caster add on. And they balance a degree of spell forging with the ability to, in this case, there's a place called the Mirror Dimension, and bits of it are falling off, and there are these essentially mirror majors can see these floating panel, floating reflective magical panels, um, or uh, everywhere they go. It must be quite a maddening experience. Mm -hmm. So they can do things like uh, create mirror weapons, they break off a thing that sort of looks like a sword, and you know, away you go. Mm -hmm. They can create. They can use it to create uh, mir mirror style illusions. They can do mirror scrying through it. Mm -hmm. and they can, at one level, create a sort of like a kind of dummy version of themselves that can wander around for a bit, and you know, hopefully, people will follow it, and they they can go in the other direction. But it, it sort of can't do very much other than appear to be them, and has about five hit points, but. Mm -hmm. And it's easily killed, but uh, so they so so the mirror is the being able to manipulate the mirror realm 
is a kind of a an interesting flavor but ultimately they have slightly slightly reduced capacity to spell forge because they have all these other fun things they can do mm -hmm. now when it comes now with that with that in mind with that in mind um with the, with their particular form of magic, because of how customizable spell um, spell forging is, yeah. is does is that going to play a factor into the spells that they well forge when they're able to when they're able to do so? Uh, I think well, spell forging. I mean, they can still make you know based on the amount of fate points they have. They can if they want to make something totally different that doesn't pertain to mirror magic at all like a you know a lightning bolt attack or something like that mm -hmm. then they can do um so it, it it's kind of down to the the sort of the, the player's discretion you know the player might want to create a character that lends itself to being more of an illusionist or they might think well my character can do these illusiony sorts of things but it, you know it's, it needs to have a bit of firepower as well so it's a it's a matter of taste Mm -hmm. So, with the with that in with that in mind, the I think the now with the with mirror magic is and and that particular that particular caster, um, mm -hmm. I I think we're talking are we talking a full class we're talking a full class with that kind of thing if I'm yeah if I'm correct well the, the the mirror mage will be like one of the one of the caster add-ons like mm -hmm. uh, the vow binder the fate weaver and the yeah. the tome bearer. So uh, again, if you can start off with say a Marauder, when you get to level three, you can whack on the the Mirror Mage add-on uh, and um, level up a bit as a Mirror Mage, where you can level up permanently as a Mirror Mage if you wish, or you know, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So oh, but the other the other end that I wanted to go go into is that of the Seers. Yes, oh, I like the seers. The seer was something I was trying to do ages ago, and it sort of just didn't work the first time round. Um, and until so we 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 figured out a sort of a way of doing it. So if you imagine reality in all the five dimensions is kind of like an onion, uh, and there are different kind of levels of reality all all around us. Um, there are beings that exist alongside us that we can't see uh, and, and experience that might be able to to see us and lay traps and snares and things like that. Um, I, re I read a thing a while back of you know, theorizing about you know aliens and why we haven't encountered them yet. And someone said, well, you know, if they are, if they do exist and they are so advanced, they're probably here already, and you know, they're beyond our ability to kind of can perceive, and they're probably you know. You know, right next to you, but mm. they're, they're kind of intangible. And I thought, what if you're able to see beyond the kind of the, the veil of, of this reality uh, and you can see that almost the, ne the, the, the next level, the next sort of uh, a tier of reality? Mm. And that's what a, a seer can do. So they don't, then it's not like they're stepping into another dimension. The, the other tiers of reality are kind of all around them. They just can't perceive them. Well, mo most people just can't perceive them, but they can. So that they can notice sometimes that the work, you know, they might be sat in a tavern and they'll recognize that um, the chairs that they sat on, they sit on have kind of become a strange sort of eldritch kind of uh, uh, sort of, fungus or something like that and um, they, they recognize that there is a power with it, with them in the tavern that only they they can see and at a higher level they might be able to communicate with it mm -hmm. negotiate with it bargain with it um at, at much higher levels they can they sort of traverse this uh, you know astrally project into this uh, different level of reality uh, and move around and, uh, and even find uh, kind of um, weapons within it and handy things like that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, ah, what, what if you had something like, and this, this 
opens up a whole can of worms, which I'll get to in a moment. What if you had something like a magic version of the Netrunner that could essentially, if you're you're there in a in a in a stuck in a dungeon, your guy, your seer can project into this other level of reality where he can step out and, you know, persuade whatever being there is there to open the door and that that kind of thing. And then that actually has a has a, an effect in the normal level of reality and, and, and away you go. Mm-hmm. And of course, the problem with that is all, everyone will write in and talk about the uh, the Netrunner problem or the Decker problem, if you like, to mm-hmm. play Shadow, Shadow Run. Yep. Um, and so the way that they fix that, I've borrowed this completely from Cyberpunk Red, the way they fix that is that the, the Netrunner is still kind of conscious um, in, in Cyberpunk Red, it used to be the Debt Runner would go into a trance and like Neo in the Matrix and disappear off into their own little realm for a while, and mm-hmm. the rest of the party are drumming their fingers, getting bored and fed up, while the Net Runner and the the GM are having their own kind of love in together. So now, yeah, I, ca- anyway. I called it I called it a duet problem when I talked about it, and yeah, it's and I I ended up ca- I ended up calling back to that when I was doing it. When I was discussing why scions are are considered a problem class, because in the early days of D anD D, there was a there was an entire separate combat system just for psychics. Yeah, I'll give you yeah. one guess as to why that didn't stick around. Well, yeah, yeah, people people don't like that. Um, but anyway, so we we created the the seer, so they they can st- they can do these things at the same time as the rest of the party are are acting, and it all kind of works together. But you know, uh, thank you, Mike Pond Smith, for fixing that one for me. <laughs> uh, the credit goes to you. Um, so so that's that's kind of how we how we do the uh, the, the seer, and and we call it obviously the seer because uh, the seer. Because the you know if you think of the, the kind of the etymology of the word, if somebody was the the the, the, the uh, you know in, in ancient societies when there was a seer, they were literally seeing beyond um, the the mundane world, mm-hmm. and they would be the the people's link between the mundane and the the divine. You know that's what the the kind of the, the holy man or holy woman was there to do, um, and and so. We've we've consciously, and we are going to do something with this. We've consciously left out kind of cleric stroke priest characters uh, because yeah, the, the one god that there is to ask for help has exploded. Um, but we are we've we've got a character that kind of can see beyond um, the the normal world, mm-hmm. and, and we are working on a character in the, for the next edition of the Arklander something that kind of exists um hi, something that exists sort of between in the realm of kind of medicine weird science and kind of uh, quasi ritualism mm-hmm. uh, called the blood binder which um will be the, the the party's healer with a series of horrible twists um, you know, if you want to be healed by the blood binder, you're going to have to accept what they do, and you and it might it might have a few side effects, and uh, you know, you might be slightly different after they've done with you, but you'll be alive, and that's the main thing. Yep. But we haven't we haven't fully written that one yet, so uh, but I just thought I'd mention that now. Mm-hmm. I I can certainly get I can certainly get that, and when you mentioned when you mentioned a. Un- a um, unorthodox met- method of healing. For whatever reason, I'm picturing a bl- I'm picturing a bloodbinder wearing a wearing some wearing some ver- some variation of a plague mask. Just yeah. Co- just and just covered just covered head just covered head to toe. They'll, cer- yes, they'll certainly it- heal you, but everybody is kind of creeped out at them. Yes, it's it's that kind of thing. It's the um, we fa- I, I I drained this kind of I this sort of eye core this this goo from. Uh, this this creature I found a while back, and I'm pretty certain it has transformative healing properties. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick it into you now, um, and it's a bit of an experiment. But you are bleeding out, so you have no choice. Uh, and you you might find that this heals you, and you might not quite be the same afterwards. You, you know, 
They might have scales. You never know. Um, and it's it's that kind of thing, you know. But what I, I always think that the one of the problems with is fifth edition in that in terms of healing, there is not anywhere near enough jeopardy involved. Um, it's and, and I'm trying to kind of bring bring that back, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I appreciate that you're do, that you're doing so in a way that isn't just trying to replicate what came before. Um, yeah, a lot of people have this idea that if that if we need if we're going to bring peril back, that we need to start replicating the days of AD of AD and D second edition or even even BX, which I think I think is um I think is applying a I think is applying a bandage rather than a fix if yeah. th- if that's the if that's the route that one wants to take. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of these things, I mean, there are a lot of people that really like the way Fifth Edition went, and you know, I think there are many good things about Fifth Edition, and there are many things that make me cringe. And so, I I never think about what we're doing as as a fix. It's just like a, a menu option if you're if you're bored with the existing choices. This, mm-hmm. you know, you know, in a, a restaurant, they'll put the specials board up. And I think that's what we, we, we're trying to do. It's like, we have no problem with the burger and fries on the main menu, but we, we, we're doing something with a little bit of <laughs> sprinkling little extra spices, you know, to yes. push, the, push the analogy to breaking point. Uh, and, you know, some people will get with that. Some people won't. Yeah. Now, I should I should note when it came to your description of the seer, there is there is one thing I was reminded of, and this is get this is going to get a look this is going to get a little bit, a little bit um out out there, but just work with me. Years ago, I remember reading a report of a a um very a very small group of women. We're ta- we're talking we're talking le- less than a thou- less than a thousandth of a per- of a percent of a given population. Who mm-hmm. were near tetrachroma- tetrachromatic? In other, they weren't able to fully see into it, but they were very close into being able to see um, into the UV spectrum. Okay. Wow. So, so the so, so, good. So so yeah so so they would be able to experience what bees experience. <laughs> Some. Something, cl- something close, but again, they again, it didn't go that it didn't go that far. Oh man, and you just would not, you wouldn't need drugs, would you? I, I don't need, I don't need drugs anyway because I because <laughs> fa- because face of a, one face of a frog exists, and two, um, I I end up being exposed to Return to Oz way too young at an age way too young <laughs> for God. it. And, <laughs> I remember. I remember being. At, I remember being at um when I was working at a vi- at a video rental store, because I'm that because I'm apparently that damn old. Um, yeah. There would there there would always be that there would always be that one that one pa- that one parent who grabbed Return to Oz, thinking it was going to be as fun and whimsical as <laughs> as the Wizard of Oz, and you know how there's that shoulder devil that you know there's that um shoulder devil that wants to get you to do bad things. Yeah, that shoulder devil told me two words: say nothing. <laughs> yeah, your kids will love the wheelers. Yeah. yeah, I, I technically didn't lie about anything I said. Yeah, I said I said that it would be like the original, like the original, but not, but um, <laughs> but with but with safeguarding concerns, you know. <laughs> um, of course, of course, the big, the bigger offender was when somebody would bring, would, somebody would put Watership down in front of me and, and um, and ask if, and ask if it was a, if it was a good, if it was a good family film. Um, I would, ha- I would have a existential moment. I would have an existential moment with my moral compass doing that. <laughs> yeah. Because the, well, my son. My mo- my wife's an English literature PhD, mm-hmm. and um, my son, you know, Chip off the uh, off the old block, is was asking her uh, a, a, for some reason they've mentioned this is like how surreal schooling in Great Britain is. They'd mentioned Franz Kafka's story Metamorphosis, where you know, it's this guy Gregor Samsa wakes up as a beetle, 
Mm. It's, a, it's a pretty horrible story and has a very, really horrible ending. And my son asked my mum, not my wife, sorry. Well, well that's Freudian. Well, where did they go there? Ah, <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa. Are you ever going to edit anything? That's no. The, that's the moment. Okay, right. Okay, well, people will now look at me in an entirely different light. But, but we're, so we're, going, we're doing Freud and Kafka in literally 30 seconds. But my son asked my wife, did it have a happy ending, the story? And before she could answer, he said, I know what happens. He goes off into the forest and makes lots of new beetle friends. And my wife went, yep, yeah, that's it. That's what happens. <laughs> That is what happens, um, and I think I think we should they there should be that bit in, in anything distressing. If you don't like this, just you know make up the ending that you that, that you like. You know that, that you'd be happy about that. You know the, the wheelers turn out to be nice in uh, in uh, Return to Oz, and and uh, they they they're, they're simply kind of like a like an Uber for for Oz, you know. Now, when it comes to the when it comes to the when it comes to some of the some of the origins, um, I think I think we went through I think we went through most of, most of them, but there's a few there's a few that I did want to dive dive a little bit more into. Oh. Um, now we we've ta- one of one of them that I that um. That I want, that I wanted to, was the Delvins and their their power of mumbles. Yes, yes. These are this is one of my my better creations, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, there's I don't know if you've got it in America, but there's an amazing sitcom in Britain called Derry Girls. It's about the story. It's four girls in Northern Ireland during mm-hmm. the during the Troubles of the 1990s and it doesn't sound like it's kind of comedy gold but it is and in there there's one of the girls has an has an uncle who is so excruciatingly boring and tells kind of endless rambling stories that hurt the brain and i thought wow what an amazing thing for a character to be able to do Mm. and the, the the delvins who sort of look like kind of disaffected smiths fans from about 1986 but with little horns um can do this and they they they, you know if they're they're stopped by kind of guards and say where are you going they'll begin to tell this uh story that rambles and says but yeah well it's you know my sister her husband who's uh, he's in cotton milling and oh it was a terrible business really isn't it and they uh and all oh, yes and uh, her 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 brother frank uh, you know ingrowing toenails is all you know oh and it has a sort of there's obviously a kind of little sprinkling of magic here mm. that means that the other person doesn't want to listen they find it boring and agonizing but they just kind of need to know what happens next in this this sort of never ending story of kind of trivia and dullness mm-hmm. Until they kind of start to have splitting headaches and begin vomiting, and and I think people will relate to this because everyone's got a delving in their life somewhere, haven't they? You're either next to them at work, or it's Christmas or Thanksgiving, as you've had recently. Mm-hmm. You'll be there, um, and sometimes you know you, you'll meet people and they'll just be outright offensive and have all sorts of dreadful views. Sometimes you meet people and they're slightly worse; they're just unimaginably tedious and won't shut up. And you sort of can't get away from them. Mm-hmm. And I think, wow, if you can bottle that and do some role playing with it, what what fun could you have? Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm giving that as a kind of like a golden gift to players. It's a bit. It's a big nod in there, going, you know, go go for it, folks. Really, yeah. really bore each other to death. I remember. I remember as a kid, there was this recurring. There was this recurring gag character in Animaniacs who. Would um, it's it. I think he. I think he was meant to be a parody of like Ben Stein, especially yeah. with the way Ben Stein speaks. But he, you would you would go with the cat. You would go. You would open up with the with 
some sort of small talk, some sort of small talk and a handshake, and he would just keep going on and on and on and just wouldn't let go of your hand. Yes, that's it. That's what a delving can do. Um, they're kind of sort of like hustlers and smugglers and things like that, and so they they use this ability to to deadly effect if they're ever caught. Mm-hmm. And. I don't. And as far as far as as far as the, I think I think one of the other things was the what I was curious about was the, um, Rao Hachi because the, you describe you describe them as as riders and almost horse lords. Yeah. Uh, well, there's in the Spellforge's companion. There is a a, a, a a human class you can play, or a human origin you can play, called the Hachi, mm-hmm. who are a kind of a tribal people. Uh, I think the way I try to do it is, you know, you have to be um, really, really, really careful when you're. If you say, right, this is a direct, uh, a, a, sort of amal- a direct kind of uh, version of, say, the Comanches, and you're not actually. Uh, involving uh, Native American people, or you are not, you know, of Native American origin, and you know, you you can't write about people without those people. It's just you 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 can't do it. It's just really really not okay. So I tried to write a kind of, uh, and I think probably the um, who are the the the, the uh, uh, who are the in Game of Thrones? What's the, the the tribal people there? The, the Cal the goes from the Dothraki. So, so I think George R. R. Martin probably based them on on the Mongols, but it's a more kind of a, a general sort of sense of a tribe, a, a, a nomadic tribal people. And the Hachi, I thought, well, what if you took people who were kind of like from the steppes of Central Asia, uh, who had aspects of Native American culture, uh, and you. You introduce and you set them into around the tenth or the eleventh century of development. Or, if you ask yourself the question, what would it have been like if the if the Normans had discovered America in the eleventh century, established castles all down the east coast, and then um, maybe they failed to conquer the the Native American tribes? But the Native American tribes look at it and go, right, we need to develop the same infrastructure. We need uh, me- we need metal armor metal weapons, arrows, all that kind of stuff. 200 years later, what sort of a people would you have? And that the Hachi in um, the Arcverse are a tribal people that have kind of moved with the times and been able to, a, able to have that, that sort of development. What happens is one of their tribes is um, sucked into the phantasm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, and they, nobody knows where they're gone. Uh, I didn't know where they'd gone until I read the phantasm. I was like, ah, that's where they went. Yeah. Um, and the, so the Rauhachi um, have to kind of fight for their lives, uh, and um, the, um, the 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 sort of the, the servants of one of the kind of the the avatars that hates on the Caius, um, uh, they. They, they sort of wage this, this bloody war with them and eventually the, the Rao Hatch, you make it to sort of a, a roughly safe part of um, uh, uh, of the phantasm where they, where they survive. Mm-hmm. And the question is, well, are they going to go back or not? And um, time moves more quickly in the phantasm. So they've, they've been there for, uh, you know, instead of being there for being missing for 300 years, they've been there for about 3,000 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they can... Uh, they have various kind of abilities uh, that come as a re- come with them as a result of having been in the phantasm that uh, normal mortals don't have. Mm-hmm. So that, that's their story. Yeah, and when it, now with that in, with that in mind, I think I think you had also mentioned th- within the Kickstarter page that you that um. There is going to be a bit of an adventure that is meant to, I guess, be I guess be a travelogue to yeah. to the book to the to the phantasm. When it do you plan with that particular adventure? Do you pl- 
what would you say the level range for that is going to be? Is it again? Is it going to be um, three at the minimum? Yeah, it's three, probably leveling up to seven or eight. I w- I would imagine. Um, so those, I think that's the the sweet spot for for role playing in, in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, when you start to uh, level, yeah, things I think become progressively less interesting. Uh, as you get, as you venture beyond level nine, that's my general, that's my general feeling. But that that kind of really nice period of space of character development. Mm-hmm. Um. So yes, that's what that's that's what what it will be. Yeah. Now, with that, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? For for the book of fantastic, we it's going to be about normally we're about 150 to 160, so that's where we're going to going to keep it. When we do Arclands 2.0, which is going to come not next year but the year after, I think that's going to that's going to be a monster. That's going to be maybe go up to 300, uh, a sort of a real. That's what I want anyway. You know, um, you, you never know how these things will work out. Okay. So my, my little boy at the door telling me that it's three minutes till tea time. So <laughs> uh, if you can hear that, uh, if you can hear that, listeners out on the internet. Um, so so yeah, that's that's what we are we are going for. Yeah. Um, and I, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? I know I know you wrote in uh, March twenty twenty three on the Kickstarter page. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That that's probably. Yeah, I, I would think so. I would think so. Um, the the Kickstarter at the moment, I mean, basically it's sluggish, I would say. So even if it doesn't fund, and that's, I don't think that will happen. I think we'll get there. But if it doesn't, we we're still going to be releasing at that time anyway, and we'll make sure everybody who uh, who would have backed us gets a different opportunity to to get their hands on the copy. Mm-hmm. So. We were in this situation where I, I know we've had three hits, so maybe we'll have a miss this time. But it won't; it'll just be a Kickstarter miss. It won't be a miss miss. Um, I just think had, just had to make sure to knock on wood. Yeah, yeah, I know. We, I mean, we're, and we, we're pushing an expansion book, and I think that is it's a harder proposition. I think it is, um, and um, uh, but yeah, you know, I will. We'll, we'll 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 get there. I'm pretty sh- I'm pretty sure. But it's been it has been a harder one this time. I've been surprised mm-hmm. that it's um, that it's, you know look at the vanity of the of, of the writer. I'm surprised that people haven't just willingly given me vast amounts of their money for for something as I say will be good. You know how how arrogant can people get? <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll. Uh, We'll, we'll 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 do our very best, and if you know if there if, if we can't manage it, then we have a a contingency backup plan. We're blessed in having a printer here in the UK that whether we order one copy or a thousand copies, still gives us the low unit price that you'd get at the you know if you're doing a really big order. Mm. So if if worst comes to the worst, we can do we can do print on demand anyway. But anyway, yeah. less less of that. Yeah. Well, now, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. Yes. And, and with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way back up to my temple. Yeah, it's, I, I I really love our chats. I really do. This is this is about the fourth one we've done. So, and I'd like to say thanks as well, and yep. uh, thanks for having us back. Mm-hmm. And uh, when we launch next year, the 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 next one's the book of the Fae, and that's a whole other conversation. Yep. Oh. <laughs> ne- I never. As a general rule, I never trust Fae. No. No. Oh. It's- but and but at, but when that when that time comes the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged oh, take good care yep. and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness and there'll be plenty more where that came from as there always is here 
on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!